Hey folks, how you doing? It's mid-April and I thought I would give you folks my first garden tour of the year. And my purpose today is just to kind of, um, just kind of walk you folks around the yard, show you what's going on, and just kind of talk to you a little bit about some of the concepts I use, some of the methods I use uh, to maintain my gardens. So let's go ahead and get started. Yesterday I made a video about how I edge gardens. Not really how, but the method to my madness as far as where I cut the edges. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a link in the description if you folks wanna, if you folks wanna see a little bit more about that. And then today we're just gonna focus a little bit more about you know what's going on in the gardens. And the first thing I wanna show you is these beautiful pansies here. Uh, I got these in last week. I think we had a light frost maybe three or four days ago. I waited till the day after the late frost, but the pansies should be able to, to take a little bit of frost. So they should be good the rest of the year. Um, and then I've got, this is actually a Baptisia, a yellow Baptisia, but it's not a very, a very popular one. Uh, and I really look forward to showing you folks how that looks. I'll see if I can find the name and put it here. But this is really awesome for, for full sun and dry. It's a native plant and it's absolutely gorgeous. The Stewardia is just starting to, uh, just starting to leaf out. But um, Stewardia is looking great. This is Stewardia pseudocamellia. And I just want you folks to notice the root flare here. You know, if I can, if I can teach you folks the concept of root flare and how when you plant a tree, you really want to see that, that flare where the tree meets the ground. You never want to see a tree going into the ground straight down with the trunk because that means it was planted too deep. So I did plant this tree, I'm going to guess 12 to 14 years ago, and I made sure to scrape a little bit of dirt off the top of the ball, you know, and put the ball high enough Whereas the tree is growing in now, we're really seeing that nice root flare. The daffodils, uh, they're coming in really nicely, but I'm not really noticing as many flowers as usual on my daffodils. And one thing you can do if, if your daffodils, you know, start to be more foliage than flower is, you know, just go ahead and, and dig up the whole clump of daffodils. You'd be amazed how many bulbs are going to be in here. So what you can do is just go ahead and, and dig up that whole clump. Um, I usually wait to do it until after bloom when the flower, the foliage is starting to turn brown. Just go ahead and dig it all up and then just put like three to five of those larger bulbs back where they are and then you can move the other bulbs to other parts of the garden. And I did that, I've only done that once on these daffodils uh, these were here when we bought the house, but there's a bed in the backyard I'm going to show you folks that I, I created entirely from this one group of daffodils. You know, if you buy some nice daffodils, just wait like four or five years, divide the clump, and you can just keep spreading them forever in your yard if you want. I was at the nursery and I picked up this, um, this is a pink dawn viburnum. And they had this by the, the door of the nursery. But check out these cool pink flowers. They, uh, you know, I'm sure they forced these. Is that on film? I'm sure they forced these. But, um, you know, I'm always looking for early season or late season blooms. Anything to extend the season or just remind me that spring is coming. So, um, you know, take a look for pink dawn. Pink dawn viburnum. Uh, Viburnum Bowden, Bonats, Bonatense, I, whatever that says. Uh, I need to go back. I only bought one and I should have bought three because I always plant shrubs in, in odd, you know, threes and fives. So I need to go back and buy two more. And I also need to just pull this chickweed. There we go. I just wanted to show you folks my uh, pansies here. And what happened was, was my wife really wanted the purple ones. What I do is I'll go to the nursery and take a picture of what they have. And, you know, she said, I like the, the purple, but they were pretty much sold out of the purple. 
you know, the solid purple. So then they had some of these yellows, and I, I personally like the yellows and these blues. But if you're ever buying plants like annuals like this, and you know, they don't have all the color you need, all you need to do is buy another color and then just mix them evenly, you know, through your plantings, and it'll look perfectly natural. And I learned that concept back when I used to do pavers. And if you look at this paver walkway, there's some lighter colored pavers here, which I had to, um, when I redid this sidewalk, I made it two bricks longer. And what you do is with pavers, you never grab all your pavers from one pallet. You always mix the pallets because there's gonna be some variation colors. So as long as you just, you know, mix, mix the pallets together, you're gonna to be perfectly fine if there is some variation. So over here, we've got uh, Cornell pink rhododendrons. And right now we are in uh, hardness zone six. It's mid April and I've got these beautiful Cornell pink rhododendrons in bloom. So they're eventually gonna to grow to be probably about four to six feet tall. I mean, you can prune them to keep them pretty much wherever you want. But just um, again, early spring bloom, anything I can do to get it, I will do it. Now Cornell Pink doesn't really have much going on once it's, once it's done blooming. Well, I do have them in the front of the house here. I left some room so I can plant some other annuals or perennials for some color. But, um, you know, if I was gonna do this at a client's house, I would probably put them more towards the back of the bed or away from the house, just somewhere in the yard where you want to have a little bit of that, uh, a little bit of that pink color, just to remind you that, that spring really is coming. And then this here, this is actually a PG hydrangea, uh, hydrangea paniculata. And this used to be about four feet taller, and I just got tired of climbing on the ladder all the time. So a couple years ago, I just came through and cut it back, basically, uh, you know, right to the thick wood. And, you know, I've got some other videos on pruning hydrangea paniculata, but I just want you folks to know that, um, you know, after I pruned them here, they just, they just flushed out and, and had more growth farther down. And if you look, you can actually see, see right here, there's a new growth coming here, and then there's actually a couple new, new growth coming here, there's new growth coming here. So, you know, there are some plants that you can't heavily prune, but if you have hydrangea paniculata, PG hydrangea, uh, there's limelight is one cultivar, tardiva, pink diamond, you know, don't be afraid to, to give them a real heavy pruning if they're getting out of hand, because I guarantee they're gonna grow back 99% of the time. So over here, I've got another patch of daffodils, which I started this patch by transplanting some from the other patch I showed you. But what I wanna do is put some Asiatic lilies in the middle of here uh, to give me something else going on once the, uh, once the daffodils finish blooming. And then this is actually um, sweet peas. These were grown here. There was like one really old sweet pea. Again, this is an old farmhouse. And it used to be mixed in with, with the daffodils. So what I try to do is, is pull up some of the seedlings and move them over here. And uh, it's a little perennial and it's, it's got some cool flowers. And, you know, I just like to I like to keep the, you know, the old farmhouse feel to it as well. You know, then we've got the German iris through here. I've got a video about what to do after these bloom, which I made years ago. And I'm gonna put a link to that one in the description as well. But the German iris, basically, if you wanna grow German iris, just give them full sun, uh, hot, dry, and just let them enjoy it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even really mulch them. Uh, they just like hot, dry, baking full sun, and they're gonna do great. Last year, I divided, this is Lenten Rose, and there's a ton of, there's a ton of cultivars, you see that? So again, mid-April, this has been in bloom for at least two weeks. It's got a fairly long bloom time, but sometimes you'll actually see Lenten, Ru Lenten Rose uh, blooming, let's move away from the road, blooming when there's actually uh, snow on the ground and ice on the ground. So I had a, a, some really big plants over here that I divided and spread out a bit. But, um, 
it's another really easy plant to grow. It doesn't spread very quickly. It stays more as a clump. I, I've heard in warmer environments, it can self sow pretty well, but it, it doesn't really do it up here in the Northeast. But uh, early spring bloom, try your, uh, try your Lenten rose. And this plant over here, this is Calmia latifolia, mountain laurel, which, which grows natively around here. Uh, it grows as an understory tree in the forest. But look at all these blooms, you know, another three or four weeks, it's just gonna be covered, covered in blooms. And this one, you know, I was looking at some old pictures and, you know, it's been here for quite a while, but I never touch it with hedge clippers. I'll just get in with my, my pruning shears and thin it out. And it really, um, it's really taken off over here and doing great. Uh, Not Laurel likes to grow in partial shade, I mean, not deep shade, but partial shade. And this is definitely the shady side of the house. So if you've got a shady area, you want something evergreen, real nice spring bloom. Uh, and it actually does better, seems to me it actually does better in, in kind of poorer soils. Uh, you know, I see them growing in the wild, like on the, you know, like a rocky outcrops. Okay, and then over here, I've got, um, I've got my tree peony and I've only got uh, one, two, three flowers on my tree peony this year. And I'm kind of wondering, I, you know, I did prune it a little bit last year and I'm kind of wondering if I maybe pruned it a little bit too much because last year it had eight or 10 blooms. But um, don't let people fool you by saying tree peonies or really need a lot of care and attention. I bought a few, stuck them in the garden they, they don't like uh, the deep shade. I had them underneath some trees in a, a much shadier spot. They didn't seem to like it because competition of the tree roots and the shade. But this one, I mean, it, it looks gorgeous a couple weeks every year, and then it just blends in. This is a, a Metasequoia glyptostroboides, and I'm only saying that because I like to say it, but this is a tree known as a dawn redwood. And uh, I planted this when it was five to six feet tall. I don't know, maybe 18 years ago. And, you know, it was five to six feet tall. It was a little nothing tree. And it's just, just gorgeous now. Really easy, really easy to grow and it's gonna get huge. And again, notice the flare. You know, when I planted this, it was just a, like a little stick, like two inches in diameter tops. But it, uh, you know, it's got that nice flare. And also notice how, you know, I, I haven't damaged the roots of, of the tree with a hoe or anything like that. Um, and one thing about the Dawn Redwoods also is every once in a while I'll prune a branch and it heals so quickly. So this would have been a, a cut I made most likely last spring, I, I thinned it out a bit. And um, look at how well it's just healing over. Here's another branch that, that's healing over. And um, I think uh, I mentioned in the video about Dawn Redwoods, you know, if somebody, if somebody has a baby, uh, get them a Dawn Redwood tree as a gift. If, if they have a very large yard, like an acre of land, I mean, this tree is gonna get massive but give them a tree when they have their baby. And then, you know, this is pretty much how big the tree's gonna be uh, around the time that their child graduates high school, which is, which is pretty nifty. You know, they'll be climbing the tree. Love that tree. This is a gold mop camisiparis. And this is probably about, uh, if I had to guess, I'd say it's about 15 feet tall and it's about 12 feet wide. And I remember when I was um, earlier in my career, you know, you can buy a gold mop camisiparis in like a five gallon size and it'll be like 30 inches tall, 30 inches wide. And I can't tell you how many of these I planted in front of a house. So I wanna say right now that I, I guess you can plant a gold mop camisiparis in front of a house I, I just wouldn't recommend planting it in front of a house if, if you plan on it growing for a while because they get huge. I, I've been to arboretums where I've seen a gold mop camisiparis that's literally like 40, 50 feet tall. So uh, I think it's a beautiful golden 
you know, accent or backdrop in the landscape, but I, I, I advise against planting one in front of a house. And then this over here is a plant called Allium glaucum, and uh, a friend gave me this once, and it's just got little, it's just got little uh, stalks, kind of like Allium giganteum. It's just got a stalk with like a little, maybe three quarter inch diameter, uh, pink bloom to it. It's really easy to grow, but it just, um, it doesn't really seem to fit in, in my New England garden. I mean, it's, you know, my garden isn't anything super fancy. It's just plants I love, so it doesn't really matter, but I just, I have this in the garden and I've had to divide it. It started out as six plants and I divide it and put it all over the yard because it is easy to grow, but I just, um, it just doesn't really seem to fit in, in my, my New England garden. But easy, beautiful plant if you like it. Uh, hot, dry, low maintenance. I would not plant, alliums usually like hot and dry. Uh, they're not really big fans of irrigated gardens that, that dump water on them all the time with a really high organic matter content. Uh, and then this, this plant right here, this is called Waldestinia ternata or the barren strawberry. And what a great ground cover. I, you know, I planted a few of them years ago and every year it spreads. Several times I've dug some up and planted it in other people's yards. But if you've got, you know, this would be great for like a lawn, a lawn tree. If you've got a lawn tree and you cut like a five or six foot circle around it, plant some Waldestinia in there. It'll bloom in the spring for, you know, maybe three or four weeks with these yellow, these yellow flowers. In another week or two, it's just gonna be absolutely covered in yellow flowers. And that'll last for, um, it'll last for uh, maybe a few weeks, but uh, really easy to grow. It's dense enough to keep most of the weeds out. And, and I think it looks gorgeous. And then I've got some astilbe coming up over here. And then this is actually uh, viburnum I think it's Viburnum carlcephalum. If I can find the cultivar, I'll put it here. But it's supposed to be one of the really fragrant Viburnums. And I think it was like a three gallon pot. And I put it in maybe two or three years ago. Um, but this I grew for the early spring flower and I'll be honest, the scent. What I'd like to do in this bed is basically get two more. I always do shrubs and threes and fives, perennials too get two more and put like one, I got one there, put one in the front here and then one back there. And then this is a uh, summer snowflake viburnum, which it blooms all summer, but it's got a very upright habit to it. And I put one in years ago and it got, it actually grew up into the, uh, into the crab apple here. But what I'd like to do is get at least two more, make a grouping of three in the back but possibly five more because you can see how old this is. They don't, they don't grow out, they grow up. So summer snowflake, it's awesome. It blooms, blooms all summer. And then this here is, is some form of Chainomalies uh, flowering quince. I, I got this one, I think a couple years ago. And usually you'll only see flowering quince. It's got a really bright red flower. Usually you'll only see flowering quince uh, in modern times around really old houses because it's kind of gone out of favor. But um, actually, I don't think that's even a, that's not even a flower. That's, um, mm, that could be a fruit. I don't know, we'll see. But I don't, I don't think I put these in the right spot. They don't seem, it's either too shady over here. It's probably too shady. But the flowering quince is in bloom. Uh, all the older homes I see that have it, it's, it's in bloom now, which is mid-April. So I should probably move these or do some more research on them and, and possibly move them to where they get a little bit more light because they're absolutely, absolutely gorgeous in bloom, really bright, really colorful, but they don't seem to be too happy over here. You know, while we're looking back at this bed, which is pretty much just a bunch of dirt, um, I want to say that I've kind of been changing, I've been kind of changing the way I, I go about um, maintaining these two beds. I mean, I've just got so many beds out there and 
I'm trying to to simplify things. So for these two beds, I mentioned you know I mentioned what I was going to be doing, but what I want to do is just do groupings of shrubs over here, and over there, and you know maybe a few perennials. But I'm trying I'm trying to simplify because it's it's like a full time job just to maintain my own gardens. Uh, and then there is this grouping of um, you know some kind of a still be here, and I'd love to. I'd love to, and what I should do is just go out and buy a whole bunch more and thicken it up and just use this as the one, you know, the one perennial in the garden. You folks see this purple finch in this tree right over here? They started uh, around midwinter. I, I noticed them at the feeders more often. And uh, let me show you where they live. So my wife put this wreath on the door for Easter and uh, I, I don't want to get too close, but they built a nest. Oh, she's going to come out. She's back there. But um, there's actually a nest at the back of that wreath where the purple finches live. And, uh, you know, I, I know it's like, oh, God, there's a bird in my fancy decoration. It's very encouraging to me how nature, you know, they've got this nice covered spot, good shelter, and they're taking advantage of it. And it just, uh, I don't know, it just makes me smile when I see things like that. And uh, he's still, he's still right up over here chirping, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave them be. Over here, this was my, this was my attempt at, uh, at a square foot garden. And it turns out that it's, it's too shady over here for a square foot garden. And turns out I'm really not a huge vegetable gardener. So I, uh, you know, I've got these two raised beds, they're, they're cool, but I, I really don't know exactly what I want to do with it. But I also ended up getting this nice hoop. Um, so I probably will, I, I put some peas in here, I will put some peas in here and let them grow up on this arch. But I want to get, um, I have a hummingbird feeder that I put on this every year. And if I do that, the hummingbirds, I mean, it's funny, with hummingbird feeders, basically if you put a hummingbird feeder out, they will uh, eventually find it and uh, you'll, you'll get them. Like if you put one out, trust me, you'll, you'll get hummingbirds. So if you've ever wondered if you should or not, uh, definitely do it. And, and all I do for my hummingbird feeder is it's a one to four mix of just plain, plain sugar, you know, granulated sugar uh, and water. And so I, um, I used to heat the water and mix it but now I pretty much just do like lukewarm water. I take a cup of uh, a cup of lukewarm water, a quarter cup of sugar, stir it really, really well in um, like a saucepan, the deeper one though that would use for pasta, and then I pour it into the feeder, and they uh, they love it. And then I do change, you know, uh, once a week. I have two two sets of hummingbird feeders. So I'll take one down and rinse it out outside because there's usually ants in it. And then I'll put a new one up and let the old one dry out so it doesn't start growing stuff, you know, nasty stuff. And I'll just alternate uh, weekly. But we, we had last year and the year before, we had a hummingbird that would basically every morning, if you looked out the window right around sunup, you would see the hummingbird sitting on the, um, on the trellis, she could wrap her, she could wrap her little feet around this. So she would, uh, she or he would come down and get a drink and then sit. And it was just like, it was almost like you could see them, the hummingbird have its morning coffee. It was, it was fun to watch. And then back here, this is uh, Syringa vulgaris, a common lilac. My wife loves lilacs. I put it in, put it in, um, maybe four years ago, it was pretty small. And I, I'll be honest, I was, I was gonna transplant it this year because it's uh, never really flowered too much, but I'm seeing, I'm seeing a, a ton of blooms this year, comparatively speaking. So maybe, maybe that worked out better. And um, one thing about lilacs I see a lot is, is people plant them and then they don't really touch them. The secret to growing lilacs is you're supposed to prune out the really old wood so they uh, you know so they get the, the new wood is where you're going to get your better flowers so 
I think the rule of thumb is to prune out like a third of the older wood. By the time I usually get to them, they're, they're so overgrown, I prune out more. But on a lilac like this, if you look in, you'll see there's this one, this one big branch in there. So that could be cut back right down to, uh, to like six inches and, and let the other, the other growth come in, you know, right after it flowers, remove, you don't have to remove a third or more, you know, just remove whatever feels right and let the, let the younger wood fill out and, and, and fill in. So then over here, we've got, um, one, two, three, and I, I forgot the name, Agastache. I think it's Agastache. Smell that. The foliage, I swear it smells just like black licorice. And I put this in here because the hummingbirds are supposed to like it. And I did a video last year where I showed it and it was just covered in bees late summer. So it's, it's Agastache. All right, I'm getting better remembering, but I've got three of those coming and this is gonna eventually grow to be, to be like four feet tall. You know, this will probably actually end up blocking the path to the back here, um, but that's there because of the hummingbirds. And then this is actually some cat mint that's self-sewed and I think it's pretty cool. Smell that one too. Smell that? Cat mint has got a fairly strong smell. Obviously the cats like it. And then this is, um, this is bee balm, some monarda, which hummingbirds love. So I put some over here. Unfortunately, it's a fairly, um, fairly shady spot. Bee balm really wants to be out in full sun. So, uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see how it does. It, it did have some flowers last year, but it got, it got very lanky. And then you see back here, this is actually Columbine that's self-sewed. Every year I usually get, I usually get, you know, some Columbine over in this area. And then a year or two ago, we had a really rainy summer and it's self-sewed all along the foundation. So I try to be very careful when I'm weeding to leave the Columbine. If you ever see Columbine in nature, you'll see it growing like along streams and uh, you know, among rocks. So that's why I actually, you know, let it grow among these rocks and it seems to enjoy it. So let it enjoy it. Okay, so then over here, this is, uh, this is purple coneflower starting to come up and this will end up blooming. There's three of them. Uh, this will end up blooming in um, uh, purple flowers and then there's some poppies here. I think these are pink. And this herbaceous peony used to be growing over there somewhere in the middle, but then the Waldestinia, you know, grew in, around it. So I transplanted it over here, but the Waldestinia kind of came with it. Peonies, uh, they seem to enjoy, you know, a pretty good amount of sun as well. And then over here, I tried, I tried growing Stokes Aster, I think this is Stokes Aster. This is just Baptisia australis. It's got the blue flowers. It kind of grows into be like a hedge. It'll grow to be pretty much the, the height of the fence here. I honestly like the one in the front yard better than Baptisia australis. This one seems to be more foliage and less flower, probably because it's in the shade. Then we've got some meadow rue coming up back here. And then this, I believe, would be a chipmunk hole. This is a larger form uh, of herb stone. Oh, it's yellow, it's got a black center, and my mind is going blank. Rutabecchia, Rutabecchia nitida, nitida herb stone. So this is a herb stone, um, Rutabecchia. It's gonna grow to be like you know, five to six feet tall and really dominate the garden late in the summer. Don't use a lot of it because it gets big and it gets big fast. And then this is actually some goat's beard, a runcus, I think it is, but it's the more compact one. Um, it does okay, but it just, just kind of sits there. I mean, it's supposed to be good in shade, so I guess it's doing okay. Maybe, maybe I should divide it and, and fill this area in a little bit. 
And then this is a little yellow Lenten rose. I mean, look at, look at that. It's a very slow grower. Um, but I want you to notice, like, look at the flowers. See the flower on this one? This is a yellow um, Lenten rose, but look at the flower on this one. So there's no dots on the, on the petals, right? But then same plant, then you see that? See how you got the dots? I don't really know. It looks like the one without the dots is growing better, but there's a bit of variation there. And then I've got some um, Simisifuga. There's one here that's starting to come up, but it looks like this area is getting kind of kind of knocked down. I mean, this is a tough spot. This this area of the garden, I've got I've got these two maple trees, deep shade. Maple trees drink a ton of water. And, and I kind of feel like this area is, is almost, I don't want to use the word lost cause, but it's a pretty tough area to grow stuff. And so I try different things and, and try more different things. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. But, um, you know, I've got some lamium I tried and uh, didn't do too well. And I made a video about this plant and I can't think of what it was. And then I've got some epimedium, uh, which usually fills in pretty well. I think I pruned it a little bit too heavily later in the winter, so that'll come back. But you know, over here I do have some some more simisifuga, and that's that's filling in okay. But this has always been it's dry shade, which is pretty much a worst case scenario. So I almost think I need to look at this area more as finding just anything that'll grow as opposed to trying to make it, you know, some kind of beautiful spectacle of a garden. And then we've got some, you know, some of that allium glaucum I moved. And then this is just another, another Lenten rose. I really like these plants. So I, I pick them up quite often and use them often because it's one of the first perennials to bloom. And then you've got your uh, hyacinth right there, too. So we must have got that for Easter at some point, and I just stuck in the garden. We're at the back of the house now, so I've got, uh, you know, I've got my daffodil swath here and my daffodil swath there. Here a daffodil, there a daffodil, everywhere a daffodil, daffodil. But um, they're really not blooming as much as they used to. I mean, my daffodils, they, they need to be divided, and I really don't know if I have the uh, energy to divide them or have a spot to plant. If I divided these, I would end up with like enough to cover like three times the space you see here. And these daffodils, they came with the house. I'm not really a huge fan of them, but they grow so easily, I kept them. But they, they definitely, if your daffodils aren't giving you the flowers they used to give you, you need to divide them. I think we, talk, we talked about that earlier in the video, so, so these are due. And then what I did earlier in the year was this was all dirt, and I brought some leaves over and just filled in around them with leaves, because usually I'll end up getting a lot of weeds between the daffodils, which, which I still am. These are all baby maple trees. These are sugar maple seedlings coming up, because that's pretty much the only tree growing around my yard. Um, but at least I don't have some other, you know, more difficult weeds. And then I've got my little, you know, this is my home for wayward plants, where I put, I put plants up here to just kind of give me a backdrop to the garden and everything's doing great. And one thing you will notice is the, um, the Andromeda here, the Pyrus japonica. Quite often your Pyrus japonica, uh, if there's a heavy frost, these flowers, are susceptible to get, you know, knocked back by a heavy frost, a heavy late frost. But we haven't really had one this year. So this is pretty much a best case scenario. Look over here. If you're growing Pears japonica, uh, it, it does really well in deep shade. If you need a plant for deep shade, it might not flower very much, but uh, it'll tolerate deep shade and, and give you something. And uh, the only problem is quite often when I go out to clients' houses to, to work at them in the spring, the flowers don't look very good. And invariably the reason is, is because we had a really heavy 
uh, late frost that, that killed back the flowers. Just be aware of it. And, and this is just a regular Peyer's japonica. I don't know, it could be a cultivar. But a lot of people now grow, there's one called like Mountain Fire, which the new growth, some of them, the new growth comes out red. So look at the bees are on them too. The, um, most of the nurseries are selling one called Mountain Fire or there's different varieties, you know, the new growth comes out red. So not only do you get the early spring bloom, but you also get new growth coming out red. And then for anybody who's been following my bird feeder trials, um, they are due to be fed right now. So if I get mauled, it's because they're, they're looking for food. But I did put, this is Arrowwood Viburnum. This is a native. So I put five of these in last year. I had some branches I put in here to keep the hawks away but it was getting kind of messy. So I'm gonna just leave the arrowwood viburnums. I got the feeder. Um, what I'm gonna eventually do is, is take this bed line and bring it around, bring it around the arrowwood viburnum. And you see how everybody's, it's the chickadee there. Everybody's like looking for, looking for breakfast. These chickadees are very, they're very friendly birds. I know I've seen some people can actually feed them from their hand and I wouldn't be surprised if eventually these guys let me get away with that. And just, just to give you folks a little bit of variety, this is a shrub called Sweetbox. It's Sarcoca, which I'm probably saying wrong. Anybody who's a you know plant enthusiast, um, feel free to correct me on that one. This is Leucothoe axillaris. I'm not really sure which one it is, but this is just one of what we call a happy accident where I, I put this row of Lakothui in and it turns out it does a great job of blocking where all my, my buckets are for my bird uh, feeders. And then this is uh, Skimia japonica. It's a low growing, kind of a ground cover type shrub. Uh, it's a little bit far north for it, but um, it's doing okay. And I, I like it, it's, it doesn't grow very quickly, but you might do better if you're like, you know, New Jersey and down, you might, you might do better with it. And then over here, this bed is, uh, this is my hosta bed over here, which, you know, look at the size of these maple trees. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's like 30 to 36 inches diameter. Uh, you know, so this is hot, dry, shade. And that's why it's hosta, because it's pretty much all I can get to grow over there. But um, this is, I think it's an Allegheny viburnum, and it's got a few flowers on it. And a friend of mine was growing these, and he gave me one. It was, it was only like a foot, maybe 18 inches tall. And I put it over here, and it's, uh, it's coming in very nicely. This is what's known as semi-deciduous, at least here in zone six where it doesn't really lose all of its leaves, but it loses most of its leaves over the winter. And so you can see now it's got, we've got the new leaves growing here. And then these are some of the leaves that, that stayed from last year. But this is definitely um, Allegheny viburnum. And I, I think it's viburnum right to the film Allegheny, but I, I can't be hundred percent on that one. Years ago, when I, when I built this bed, you know, I spread like, a few yards of compost over here. And then I put these stepping stones in. And back then I was using more mulch. You know, I was, I was over mulching most of my gardens. So I left all the stones high because I was figuring, you know, I'd put two to three inches of mulch in the bed and then it breaks down and raises the level of the bed. And because I basically stopped using mulch in my own yard, and if I did, I would just do like a, a a light top dressing, I, I, you know, I wouldn't even do two to three inches anymore. Um, but all these stones are kind of popping out of the ground. And then this is, uh, this is Tiarella cordifolia. Uh, and then these ones back here along the house have self-sown. Uh, does okay in, in deeper shade. It, it likes, you know, a little bit of an organic type soil. That's an old fashioned bleeding heart, which unfortunately uh, it's not really getting enough light. But then over here, I just, uh, some of these hosta I brought back from customers' houses. And then there's a few spots like over here where I went to the nursery and bought some hostas. So this bed is pretty much 
uh, I don't want to say done, but I mean, I was just so happy when, when this bed was filled in that I, you know, this used to just be this like moss and like three blades of grass. So now I've got it at least to be a nice bed of hosta. Uh, this is Dark Towers Penstemon. Hummingbirds like it, it gets about three feet tall. Very reliable, very easy to grow. Red foliage, whitish pink flowers. And then this is uh, Lobelia cardinalis, cardinal flower. And there used to be a downspout over here. It gets wet, the water puddles. So I planted it here. And for whatever reason, I've twice now tried to plant cardinal flower there and they keep dying. So I think I'm just gonna get some more of the penstemon and put like three or five of them in here. Give me some symmetry, but basically just something to fill that spot. And then this is an oak leaf hydrangea, which um, I can't really say it's thriving, but it's surviving. I only get a few flowers every year. It's got the nice oak leaves on it. You know, again, we're deep shade, so, so we let it do its thing. And I think if I was going to do it again, or maybe someday I'll, I'll take out some of the hosta down there and, and put a larger shrub over there. I kind of, I kind of like the fact that if you're in the backyard in the dogs area, you can see over the oak leaf hydrangea and over what's going on in the yard. I don't want to, I don't want to make the patio and the fenced in area, you know, blocked in. And over here, we've got this small garden, which, which I call my wife's memorial garden. And, um, it's a mixture of perennials and it's it's almost kind of like a home for wayward souls but it, it comes together so uh, you know at some point somebody gave my wife tulips or we got them for easter i'm not really sure but they seem to come up and be different colors every year so uh, you know i'm pretty sure these two would have been the same color i don't know they seem to change colors a lot they're like a lighter pink this year. They were like a red last year, I, I don't know. We got some of the poppies back there. So you can see I got five poppies. We're hot, dry, a little bit of shade, but they seem to do okay. And uh, poppies, I think they really want to be more in a drier spot than they definitely want to be in a drier spot than a really moist organic soil, but they're, um, they're doing okay. And then I've got some Shasta daisies over here and this is kind of cool. So we've got the Shasta daisies. I would have planted three here. And usually what happens in this garden at least is I'll be at a garden center, I'll see something cool and be like, well, why did I never plant that? Or that looks cool and I'll bring it home. And so I would have just come home with, with three Shasta daisies and stuck them in. But what happened is, is they self-sowed into the gravel here. If that doesn't say that Shasta daisy wants to grow in hot, dry, full sun, I, I don't really know what does. And then this is a flowering dogwood I think it's white, and this is the first year I've really had a good bloom on it. This dogwood is funny. I, I actually had an extra, uh, extra dogwood on a job, and I brought it back and just stuck it over here. And it's kind of lingered for the first few years because, again, we're underneath the maple trees. But last year we had an extremely, extremely uh, rainy year, so hopefully you know, it's going to flower like this every year, but if not, it's still going to be good to see. I mean, this is as many flowers I've seen yet on this tree. And then over here, this is actually a Biacovo, Biacova geranium. It's a ground cover geranium. It's a perennial. And I had groupings of these around the Dawn Redwood I showed you earlier, but real easy to grow. Does okay in partial shade. I mean, it pretty much does okay everywhere but just it, it's, it's a clumping perennial. It's slow to spread, but once it starts to get out of bounds, you gotta, you gotta dig some out and move it somewhere else or just dig some out because it will just, it will just eat a garden. Uh, I've seen it where it's been left alone for years and, and be a cova, be a covo, it'll just eat a garden. And then I think this is a, I think this is humolo. Um, humolo, um, my mind is starting to go to mush. Humolo, um, 
Lamb's ears, stackies. So I think this is uh, Hummelo stackies, stackies Hummelo, which unlike the stackies, the lamb's ears that grow along the ground with the fuzzy leaves, this one is more upright. Nice, uh, nice clump forming perennial, and uh, I, I highly recommend it. it. It stays, you know, under control, easy to grow. Once it's done blooming, you just cut it back. So uh, give that a try. And then this is, I think this is May Night Salvia over here, or some form of salvia uh, over here. And then I'm back here, this is actually uh, hydrangea arborescens, but it's a newer pink variety. And it's a little bit shady here, but I have had a few blooms. This is uh, Caria japonica, which I, I like to talk about every once in a while, because Caria japonica, here we are, deep shade, maple roots, and it's, it's about to come into bloom. So that would be like in zone six, we're talking late April, early May. Um, but Caria japonica is one of those plants where when nothing else will grow, give it a try. And I, I did cut it back a ton. It was starting to really take over the garden. And what I'll do is once it finishes blooming, I'll just cut everything basically back to the ground and let it start again. So this garden over here, you know, I have kept the weeds down and it was, it was quite a chore because there's these little weeds that are like two or three inches tall. It's this one right here. Whatever this weed is right here, It's got this little, this little basil rosette of foliage, and then it's got these little white flowers. And boy, these things just take over a garden so quickly, and they're not easy to kill. So I've been trying to keep the weeds down in this garden, and I've also come through and I've already weeded this once with the, with the weed whacker. Uh, I broke one of the pots for my elephant ears last year, and they, they weren't in stock all last year, so I saw one. And, and picked it up. That's why there's this like random pot out here. This garden, you know, I, at some point, I, I really want to do something with it, but I just, I just don't know what to do because, you know, I, I'm thinking some kind of ground cover, but I, I don't, I just don't know. I don't know what I want to use because by the time I put a ground cover in, it's going to be a lot more work to, to dig the leaves out. But you know, another thing I'd like to do is uh, put some edging blocks along here. Um, not Belgian block, but I was at one supplier once where they have a, it looks like Belgian block, but it's actually made out of bluestone. And I think it would work a lot better with, uh, with the house. So I, I'd love to, to just do one line of that to kind of define the bed. And then I could always do a compost top dressing and yeah, I'm a horticulturist, so I should know a ground cover, but I just, I can't think of any ground cover I would want this much of. But I also know that if, if, you know, when we bought the house, this was all grass. And if this was all grass, you would end up with bumping the mower into the trees. Um, it, it wouldn't be very thick grass because it's underneath the trees. So if I can keep it weed free, or, you know, for the most part, I, I'm happy. And I just want you to notice down here, you see this, this is, um, you know, this is worm castings. These are all worm castings. And I always get happy when I see worm castings because if you've got worms, you've got uh, healthy soil. And they're pretty much all through this whole bed, which means they're also in my lawn, but you know, you're basically getting free aeration of your of your soil. But the second you go and, and spray some kind of an insecticide to kill the grubs in your lawn, you're gonna kill the earthworms too. Those, those chemicals don't know the difference. This is all natural and it's not perfect. It's never gonna be perfect. But if I keep it mowed on a regular basis, if I keep the edges trimmed, it's not really gonna make that big a difference. And then over here, this is uh, Aster divaricatus. I believe it's woods aster. It's got a white flower. It's about 18 inches tall. Blooms late fall. The pollinators love it. 
I told the story last year when I was doing some work where I cut a whole bunch of this back in a garden that we're installing and I felt so guilty that I, I actually ended up planting it back in the garden because the pollinators were just absolutely loving it. So I think I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I, I did make a video yesterday about not so much how to edge a garden, but just about where to edge a garden. And I wanted to just show you folks this, you know, I've, I, I've never really done much with, with the gardens over here. And I wanna, I wanna at least create an edge and define that this side is lawn, this side is garden, and then give myself enough room that whenever I come home with something from nursery and don't know where to put it, I can, I can put it in here. You know, having a beautiful garden is very important and flower in all seasons, but if you just can keep your garden neat, I think that's half the battle because once you start getting overgrown shrubs and, and weeds all over, it doesn't look nice. So for me, it's, it's almost, it's almost like I really try to, to just keep it neat and then worry about adding plants as a secondary part of it. You hear that high pitched squeaking? That is a tufted titmouse telling me that it would like its breakfast. I know it's nearby, I just don't see it. I think that's actually a robin up there. That's weird. All right, so I just did wanna show you my, my compost pile here. And you know, I've been using a little bit of this to fill in where those stumps were. But just, um, you know, if you've got room in your yard, whenever you edge the garden, whenever you cut something back, um, just throw in a big pile and let it sit for a few years and you're going to end up with the most beautiful soil you've ever seen. And um, the, the way this works for me is, you know, I would have to, I would have to scrape the leaves off the top of this, but I actually leave the leaves on because the earthworms like that. They want to get under there and, and in the winter it, it keeps them insulated from the cold so they're they're alive under there but just um from about here this way is is about the last year's worth of debris and at some point i'll bring a machine in once i get rid of all this i'll rake all the junk back on it bring a machine in and just make a big pile and it'll break down and there's going to be a few sticks in it whenever i use the soil from here you can see, that, you know, this is all pieces of bark, which is which is aeration. <laughs> but um, you know, you'll have to thin it out. But this soil, once it sits for a while, is so much better. It's it's alive, as opposed to the soil that, if you go buy soil, you know, it's usually sitting in this giant pile, where the piles are so big, oxygen can't get into the middle of it, and it starts to smell really bad. Uh, whereas a pile like this is. It's still alive, it's got the microbes in it, it's got the organic matter, and it just, um, if you've got room on your property, I, I highly recommend you know, a pile like this. And, and added benefit, I must have dug out some daffodils and now I've got daffodils growing in my compost pile too. All right, folks, well, that's pretty much gonna do it for this one. And what I tried to do here was just basically walk around the yard and just talk about whatever's on my mind and try to share ideas and concepts and throw a few names of plants out there. So I don't think I expect many of you to have watched the whole video, but just um, sometimes I feel like we're kind of getting trapped in only hearing what, what the people who sell the materials are. And I'm trying to stay separate of that and um, talk to you like a gardener. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but um, that, that, that's my intent is to, to open your mind to some new ideas, show you some cool plants that maybe aren't mainstream and just, you know, give you some ideas. 
So hopefully we succeeded. But anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this one up for now. So thanks a lot for watching today, folks. And I look forward to seeing you soon. And don't forget to, uh, to hit that bell and subscribe. Anyways, folks, thanks, thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.